These doors going to swing wide. Okay, then. In 1999, this was the video store I managed in Toledo, Ohio. I was a movie nut. I never missed a new release for years, and when I wasn't working, I was watching a movie or reading about them. One of the film series that started all of this passion was, as you guessed it, Star Wars. So when Star Wars Episode One was on its way, I was primed and ready to explode. I was such a nerd that when I saw the flyer for the Midnight Episode One toy launch, the local Toys R Us on Reynolds Road, I was there and I bought many goodies. I even went photo happy, and I wanted to remember May 3rd at midnight forever. And I did. I was so excited. I even took my mom there the next day just to share it with her. Look at her. She's not even a Star Wars fan and she looks excited. I was so hyped that I decided to get a part-time job as well at Showcase Cinemas to experience the opening night. And this was that theater. Look at all those eager, toxic fans just waiting to share and enjoy a new Star Wars movie together. This was before there was a split in the fandom. And they had no idea what was in store for their future. Hope you enjoy it! This was about seven hours before the film's premiere at midnight on May 18, 1999. At 12.01 a.m., May 19th, I saw grown men running into the theater screaming in excitement. And yes, it was like this. Since the theater was open all night, I didn't waste time. After my shift ended, I bought a ticket at 3 a.m. I knew what to expect as I already read the hardcover novel that debuted around April 21st before the prequel came out. I'm not going to mince words. I adored this film upon release. I was really moved when the music swelled as Shmi looked upon Anakin preparing his pod racer, knowing that she might lose him like most. I cheered during the final duel and genuinely couldn't wait to see it again. I would see the film two more times that week and another two times after I moved to Nashville. Each time I thought the movie was great and that view hasn't changed to this day. But as time went on, the atmosphere towards these films continued to change. A lot of folks did not like this movie. In fact, they hated it so much it became a crusade. Years passed, and the majority of the Star Wars culture towards the prequels would mutate into this narrative. That's why we say George Lucas raped our childhood. George Lucas raped our childhood. George Lucas raped our childhood. And from there, it turned into this. I do not like these movies. I barely even like them ironically. These movies are not a guilty pleasure for me. Because when I watch them, I feel no pleasure, only guilt. Like I said in the last video, you have to be brainwashed into liking these movies. And when we weren't called brainwashed, well, fans of the prequels were patronized instead. The Phantom Menace is not Battlefield Earth bad. It's not Troll 2 bad. It's just a vastly disappointing movie. And when I say that, I mean that it really, really is a disappointing movie. If you like it, that's fine. But... I just don't understand that, but that's me. If you like it, that's cool, man. You're allowed. You're allowed to like The Phantom Menace. After dismissing such egotism, anyone who is familiar with this subject knows that most of these critics were just copycats repeating the sentiments of the popular Plinkett reviews. These mock reviews of Episode 1 have created an echo chamber of critics who use them as proof that the prequels are bad. The Plinkett reviews exchange entertainment for knowledge and are quite assumptive towards the filmmaking process of these movies. More so, Plinkett had no problem mocking fans flippantly. So you may like the characters, you know, if you're stupid. Now I don't want to pretend that there are not videos out there defending the prequels. There are, but most of them are very short and usually avoid the Plinkett in the room. One example that breaks this norm is Rick Worley's essays on how to watch Star Wars. Then there are YouTubers like Anomaly Inc. who actively go after haters of the prequels aggressively. 
There are also prequel debates online with healthy views for both prequel defenders and haters. However, I always felt there needed to be long-form analysis of Episode 1, scene by scene, that challenged all, if not most, of the views put forth by the Plinkett videos because most of their conclusions are wrong. That's why I made this video, and I intend to address every issue I can. I will also know errors in the film, as it is not perfect. In truth, I believe this film has received a really bum rap and it's my hope that I have something to contribute to this debate. So without wasting more time, let's begin. Um, before we start, we have to address this. I want you to tell me who the main character of the Phantom Menace was. I can tell you it's not the Jedi. They were just on some kind of boring mission that they didn't really care about. Plus, they are fucking boring themselves. As you watch the movie, I challenge you to figure out who the main character of this movie is. You can't. It's not Qui-Gon. It's not Obi-Wan Kenobi. And it's not Anakin. Who's the main character of this movie? Liam Neeson gets top billing, so maybe Qui-Gon is? In a way, it almost seems like Qui-Gon's the main character of the movie, but why would you do that? Who the hell is Qui-Gon? He's an older, stern Jedi who is really stern. If only these commentators understood Episode 4's format, they would have easily realized there are three main characters in this film. Each of the main characters fills the gap when one is not on screen. They are each pivotal towards the views of the entire galaxy and the world building George Lucas is trying to express. If you feel compelled to yell no at the monitor, Listen to this. This movie is told primarily from the Jedi's point of view, but the story that's being told is essentially the story of Queen Amidala and her uh, her plight of having her planet blockaded. As in, uh, say, episode four, where the story is told through the eyes of the droids, and this one is told through the eyes of the Jedi. Despite Plinkett telling you that George Lucas isn't talented enough to make a film beyond one main protagonist, it has been done before in A New Hope, which he praised. Luke may have been the main character, but the world was seen through droid eyes. He clearly succeeded in multiple main characters in 1977 and, I argue, 1999. The question really needs to be, why are the Jedi and Amidala the main characters? Let's start with Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan. You are meant to focus on Qui-Gon because he is the last example of a true Jedi. Let's quantify this in broad strokes now and go into more detail later in the videos. Firstly, Qui-Gon is without a doubt the most attuned to responding to the Force in the film. He trusts in the Force almost dogmatically, and this often gets him into trouble with the Council. Where is it going? Don't worry, the Force will guide us. Finding him was the will of the Force. I have no doubt of that. Do not defy the Council, Master. Not again. I shall do what I must, Obi-Wan. He is the Chosen One. You must see it. There are more examples of these traits throughout the film, and we will cover them all as we go. Qui-Gon is a counter to the stale, apathetic Jedi who operate under the beck and call of a corrupt political Senate. Obi-Wan is the opposite of Qui-Gon and represents the current day Jedi mentality far beyond the end of Episode 1. He is headstrong, indoctrinated, and has a lack of empathy for others which mirrors the Council's view. The film takes a point to express that Obi-Wan was trained by Yoda, and he uses this to challenge Qui-Gon who is trying to wean him from the indoctrinated ways. When Jar Jar is about to be punished for helping the Jedi, Obi-Wan has no care for him whatsoever. He glances at Jar Jar and states this. Master, we're short on time. He also has this revealing line to say on Tatooine. Why do I sense we've picked up another pathetic life form? While he is on the landing platform to Naboo, does Obi-Wan look for a private spot to speak with Qui-Gon? The answer is no. Instead, he talks about Anakin right in earshot, not caring for the boy's feelings. 
And if you think Anakin was not in earshot, just watch his reaction after Obi-Wan leaves. The boy is dangerous. They all sense it. Why can't you? His fate is uncertain. He's not dangerous. Qui-Gon, sir. I don't want to be a problem. These two will challenge each other throughout the movie. The feud between them are there to show you the clashing views that are fighting for what the Jedi mindset is going to be in the future. As you should know, Qui-Gon will not win, and the Jedi will remain stagnant till their demise in Episode 3. This kind of view can be jarring for classic trilogy fans. In the 80s, we, myself included, believed Jedi to be noble knights who were heroic pillars of good. Instead, Episode 1 tells us that they were pompous, posh, and pedantic, with Qui-Gon being the exception. Keep this at the forefront of your mind when watching this movie. The movie is more about the galaxy stage than the avatars that Lucas is using to represent these ideas. So why are the Jedi views so important to the film's narrative? Well, the trilogy is basically about the fall of the Jedi and the Republic, and the birth of Darth Vader and the Empire. It is not more complicated than that, and Episode 1 sets this stage perfectly. For example, when Anakin comes before the Council, the Jedi themselves are cold, unfeeling, and unsympathetic to this boy who is in a strange setting. The Jedi do not even seem to care about Naboo's plight. There is no discussion about action on Naboo's behalf. The Jedi are fine waiting for the useless Senate to decide what to do even though innocent people are supposedly dying, which is what Qui-Gon would have reported to the Council. Where is the righteous indignation to intervene? Instead, they send two Jedi to draw out a Sith rather than ambush the Sith with greater numbers. After Qui-Gon's death, the Jedi Council, almost all of them, have no problem and plenty of time to go to Naboo for a celebration that is earned by the cost of Jin's life. In essence, the Jedi are part of the galaxy-wide problem. They are bloated and overly confident. By the end of Revenge of the Sith, despite all their politicking and all their council meetings, the Jedi are destroyed by the very government they protected because they were blind to the Force by hubris. This is what the film shows us. Had they been open to Qui-Gon's ways, things might have been different. This is pushed home because at the end of Revenge of the Sith, it is Qui-Gon who teaches Yoda and Obi-Wan how to become Force ghosts and to see beyond what they know. Qui-Gon is at the core of the galaxy-wide Jedi story. For this reason alone, he must be the focus point, and Obi-Wan must be his counterbalance. Kenobi will also be the thread that continues in later films. Ironically, this world-building is also tied to the second biggest gripe from prequel hate, and this involves the third main character. So without further ado, I invite Mr. Plinkett to explain the premise. So the Trade Federation have set up a blockade around Naboo in order to stop them from getting space supplies, which instantly causes some kind of crisis that we never see. Okay. I don't get it. Why would an organization called the Trade Federation want to blockade trade? The point is, I'm still not sure what the donut ships were there to do. And don't any of you f it's tell me that it was explained more in the novelization or some Star Wars book. What matters is the movie. I ain't never read one of them Star Wars books, or any books in general for that matter. I ain't about to start. So in The Phantom Menace, the Trade Federation is doing deals with the Emperor when he's Darth Sidious, he's not the Emperor yet. It's a big ploy so Palpatine can become Chancellor and that's pretty much it. On the other hand, he wants Natalie Portman to sign this treaty, which you gotta think he doesn't want her to sign the treaty. Because if she signs the treaty, he won't get into power, so yeah. And as we're sitting in the theater, we begin to realize we're watching a movie about political squabbling, trade negotiations, and peace treaty signings, and backhanded politics and Senate meetings. Practically every negative review shuns the politics of episode one, and honestly, it's more meme than commentary by now. All of them know how confusing the politics are, and although the movie does not answer all your questions, it does lay out what is going on fundamentally. 
Here is what the movie tells us. The Galactic Senate has placed a tax that annoys these Nimodians, and they don't like it. In protest, they blockade Naboo. The planet they pick happens to have no known army to defend itself, just security volunteers. It also just happens the Nimodians are in cahoots with this guy, who happens to be from this very planet. The guy from this planet is not revealing his alter ego and is clearly using the Nimodians to gain power. Jedi are secretly sent by General Zod in an attempt to help the situation because the Senate is bogged down in bureaucracy. At the center of all this is Queen Amidala, main character number three. This film is her journey into the galactic politics that would have destroyed her planet had she not interfered. Without her, we would have no one to show us how Naboo survives, nor would we have a vessel to show us the rot on Coruscant that will eventually lead to the Empire. When you understand why these three are the main characters, Episode One transforms into a crisper vision. It is about a galaxy more than the characters that inhabit it. The film expects you to grasp these clear fundamentals, and if you can't, the film can seem muddled to you. If you do understand the premise, then there are more questions to ask for sure, like what do the players want from the blockade, and why are the Jedi being sent secretly, just to name a couple. I will address these issues as we go, but these questions, when answered, are just more depth to add to the world building that is in process. It should be noted that many state, including Plinkett, that politics shouldn't be in a kid's film. Why not? There are many kids in the world who loved Episode One when it came out, and many of these kids are grown up today, and are staunch fans of this movie. When Captain America Civil War came out, I don't remember anyone complaining about the Sokovia Accords and the politics involved with that, as it was the core to the conflict that created a rift between the Avengers. What about Harry Potter as well? The politics of the Wizarding World that included the Ministry of Magic and the social status between communities would later be indispensable for furthering the storyline. A larger example was David Lynch's Dune. It also had trading cards and figures targeting kids in 1984. I remember many kids in my middle school talking about it back in the day. Without the book, many couldn't really connect to it. It was hard to comprehend the Bene Gesserit, the Navigators, the politics, and the feud between the houses of the Lonsrod. I know plenty of folks who didn't get the 2021 version either. Although Dune was not that successful back in 1984, it was popular with some circles in the younger generation, and it was way more complicated than Episode 1. You can argue that Dune was PG-13 and wasn't specifically for kids despite the products made for them, but that is not the point. In the end, the complaint should be about the execution of the content. Episode 1 is usually pronounced guilty by many critics for just having politics in a kid's film, and it's baffling that this narrative still continues today. On the opposite end of the spectrum are other lame critics that will tell adults who have issues with the Disney Star Wars movies something like this. This is a film about space wizards intended for children. This line, like Plinkett's complaint on politics, is an attempt to dumb down content. Stop trying to gatekeep our individual expectations and intelligence with such dribbling argumentation. Movies can be layered beyond the sum of their parts, and any age can latch onto it if they grasp it. On a side note, there are many books explaining a lot of Star Wars. Like many fans, I read about 20 or 30 expanded universe books even in the Disney era. But I always kept this material separate. It's cool to learn things about characters in the EU to enhance a film, but sometimes this is a Pandora's box of confusion. I say this because there are many ways to view Star Wars depending on what canon you respect. Classic EU clashes with current EU. Some refuse to accept animated into canon. Some reject the Disney trilogy canon. 
Most Disney Plus shows even cancel past movies and on and on. It is a mess and you can't accept all spin-off material because one will contradict the other inevitably. Thus, when we are talking about episode one, I will be discussing the film, commentaries, and on a side note, deleted scenes for fun. I also have no problem respecting film novelizations or visual dictionaries because they came out before or during the movie release. The writers of these books were working off the original script and production photos for their books to coincide with the original concept. Film novelizations are usually identical to the original film script with a few tidbits of insight and deleted scenes that would not be discovered until years after the movie release. I treat such materials as salt and pepper to enhance a movie. For instance, the Alien 3 novelization in 1992 added so much to the movie experience back in the day, and we never saw that material from the book until the 2003 cut on the DVDs. It's a movie I would love to talk about at a later time. I think the most important thing that George Lucas left out of the crawl was the fact that the blockade is in its 30th day. This was in the novel for the film. The novel explains that the Jedi answer to the Senate and not the Chancellor. This would later be repeated by Lucas in the Revenge of the Sith commentary for the DVD. In this film, the Chancellor requests two Jedi to intervene because the Senate is not getting the job done, and he is tired of doing nothing. Remember that the Trade Federation is in this Senate, and many Senators are getting rich by this organization, and taxes to this faction will cause many to lose wealth. Thus, those for the Federation are fighting tooth and nail to keep the issue unresolved. This is clearly suggested in this film. So what Valorum does by sending the Jedi is very risky because he can be seen as overstepping his authority. Attack of the Clones also establishes that the Federation and those that support them would become the foundation of the Separatists. After the Jedi arrive, the first conversation is a clash of views between teacher and student. This was done on purpose. These contrasts will continue in the majority of scenes that they share together for the rest of the film. A common complaint is that TC-14 assumes that the visitors are Jedi as if they are in disguise. Why would the Jedi hide who they are to these aliens? Anyways, the Nemodians panic and destroy the ship and try to kill the Jedi. Many complain that the Trade Federation are terrible villains because they are so cowardly and with a weak army. The fact of the matter is that the Trade Federation are only pawns to the true villain and Lucas wanted the Jedi to appear unstoppable in these early scenes per his audio commentary. It was very important in the beginning here of the film to establish that the Jedi were invincible. I've kind of reversed the classic monster coming through the door uh, motif uh, where you and make it where the, the, the aliens and the droids and all the villains are faced with these two sort of invincible creatures, you know. Lucas is basically flipping the standard narrative. When I first watched episode one, I felt pity for the Trade Federation because they were way in over their heads and the movie never convinced me otherwise. This does not diminish the threat of the Federation. Their numbers are what is dangerous and the fact that Naboo is basically defenseless. The real threat the film wants you to pay attention to is the Phantom Menace, who has just ordered the Nemodians to kill the Jedi, which leads us to this. Hey asshole, how about you leave the door closed for like four hours, and then if they try to cut through the door, start shooting them in the face. Then pump in more gas and keep pumping it in. Can someone please tell me how much time passes between this cut and this cut? Watch the cut again closely. I want you to notice the yellow battle droid guarding the door. It is an Oom-9 commander droid. The security guard droids which all approach are red with no Oom-9 so it's evident the guard was on the door before the security droids arrived. This means that at some point after the Jedi arrived or after the Jedi were gassed, a droid was posted to guard this door. 
For all we know, the droid was here 60 seconds to an hour. We don't know for certainty, and we can't assume all this happened instantly. Another gripe is that there are no blaster marks among the hallways during the fighting. I never even noticed this. I could guess that the hallways are made of some material that prevents damage, or it was just an oversight by the animators. So they opened the doors anyways, and they let the Jedi out and attacked them with completely useless robots. Just tell them to leave, and then you don't want to negotiate. And then when their ship flies out of your space dock, shoot it with lasers! Also, we need to consider the fact that killing two Jedi that were sent there as peaceful ambassadors would be a pretty heinous crime in the eyes of the Galactic Senate, an organization that runs everything, including the space taxes. I mean, you could just claim that they never got there, but now you've got the burned wreckage of their ship inside your horribly burned docking bay. With all these droids at their disposal, if there was debris and scarring, couldn't they have just fixed it up within hours after jettisoning the damaging evidence into space? Crime scenes can be sanitized, you know, and quickly if there is an organized effort. In fact, it makes more sense that these cowardly aliens acted on impulse because it fits what was established in earlier scenes. Although I would agree that blowing up the ship outside the craft is the way to go, I wouldn't agree that these guys would be so logical. Also, the argument that the Nemodians should go in and tell the Jedi to just leave and that there will be no negotiations does not stand up at all when thinking of the mindset of these aliens. If I was Palpatine, I would not let these guys anywhere near borderline thought-sensing Jedi to initiate any dialogue with them. In Palps' eyes, the only real choice is to just kill them rather than risk exposure. In the end, Plinkett's arguments are formed by a lack of paying attention to the basics of the Nimodian traits, and the film makes it clear that they are insecure cowards from the first scenes. So what do the Nimodians get out of this situation? Well, obviously they are trying to get rid of the taxation, and that makes sense. Whatever they are doing seems to be covered politically by Darth Sidious, so that follows as well. What doesn't make sense is the invasion. I assume they are invading the planet to assert resources, but I cannot wrap my head around the idea that such an action could ever become legal or tolerated. If Amidala signed a treaty, I would have a hard time believing the Republic would sanction it. No doubt for image sake, Palpatine would cry havoc all the way to a higher office seeming a hero. Palpatine cares nothing about his home world, and as long as the crisis lasts, the more attention he would get. I have no doubt this is the reason why he wants a treaty forced. Having a treaty instead of a straight-up conquest would convolute the issue more in the Senate. When Amidala showed up at Coruscant, this actually screwed up Palpatine's initial plans, and so he pivots and uses Amidala to his advantage. All of this is logical and makes sense. However, I can't understand how the Trade Federation ever assumed they would succeed at this invasion in the long run. I have to be fair and say I would knock this issue up as my first official plot hole to this film. On a side note, the Visual Dictionary states that Naboo is very rich in plasma and that the Federation wants to get their grubby hands on it, but the movie doesn't even hint to this, except at the end of the movie when the Duel of the Fates is occurring in the plasma refinery next to the Theed hangar bay. However, most in the audience has no clue that they are fighting in a plasma refinery. So what is the next problem that Plinkett has? So then for no reason they decide to stow away on different ships. Let's split up. Stow aboard separate ships and meet down on the planet. Is this guy a fucking retard? Maybe that's why they call him Qui-Gon Jinn. Because he's always drinking gin. This is a minor point, but what would going down on the planet on separate ships accomplish? Let's think about this. Number one, increase the chances of getting caught by 100%. Two, have no one else to help you if you get caught and get into a fight with robots. 
three, increase the possibility of getting separated by hundreds, if not thousands of miles by not knowing where the other craft is going to land on the planet. But thankfully they both aren't discovered and they meet up in the same spot in the woods. This is an easy answer. If one gets caught, the other has a chance to succeed in the mission. It does not multiply a chances to get caught as Plinkett suggests. Two people apart are harder to find than two together. The mission is to warn the Naboo, not to keep each other safe. Also, the Jedi have no idea where these ships are going. Stowing aboard separate ships increases the chance that they might be on a ship that lands closer to Theed. So for our next scene, we are introduced to Queen Amidala. A few folks complain that it is stupid that anyone would vote for a 14-year-old, or that a society would elect a queen since royalty is a birthright. As far as the title queen goes, I assume they use this title for tradition's sake, or maybe this society sees the title as something else. There's nothing in the movie that negates these possibilities. I don't want to write the script for the movie, as this topic is a bit minor to the film, but it is often argued by naysayers. I could argue that we are ignorant of the social structure of this culture. Maturity and responsibility may be demanded at a younger age. I certainly can believe that a 14-year-old could do the job because throughout history we have examples. I can cite Gordian III, who was 13 when he ruled Rome. Tutankhamun took the throne at nine years old in Egypt. There are a lot more than that to list. And it also seems Amidala has a good counsel to help her navigate decisions. So why did the ships park so far away from Theed? Well, because they were just assembling on the ground to begin the invasion. I certainly know they didn't park on the other side of the planet like Plinkett claims, but we'll get into that in a few minutes. What I do know is that the shots of the invasion are wonderful, and at the time when they were released it was visual candy. Often, many complain about the CGI in the film. Critics not fond of episode one state that the effects in the film have not dated well. That's like saying Ray Harryhausen movies had too much stop-motion animation in them. Or that the black hole was garbage because it had too much computer effects in 1979. Who criticizes Tron for its effect in retrospect as well? Episode 1, like the films I mentioned, were cutting edge for their time. The prequels paved the way for visuals of the future, and the CGI expanded Star Wars. I don't look at the classic Star Trek episodes mocking the alien costumes that they used. Instead, these mediums are a product of their time, and they should all be appreciated for what they did. In 1999, this film seemed years ahead of the competition. We had never seen anything like this. There's not much more to say about this issue. So, let's get to every fan's favorite topic. Jar Jar Binks. I really can't do justice to this discussion about this character. When I first saw the film, I really had no feelings about Jar Jar, but when I took my six-year-old niece to see episode one, she loved him. Through her eyes, I guess I understood why he was in the movie. My daughter Destiny also liked Jar Jar, and he was the reason her interest in Star Wars was sparked. In a film as complex as this one, Jar Jar really throws a lifeline to the younger audience, and it makes perfect sense why he's in the film for commercial reasons. To those that hate him, I can only say the best way to look at him is through the eyes of someone under 12. After all, he is in this movie for them, and since there were tons of kids who loved him in 1999, I would argue that his inclusion helped the movie regardless of personal biases. To the fans who grew up with the classic trilogy, it's really about perspective. We want Star Wars to be a certain way, and during the 90s, Lucas was telling us that it was going to be a different way. He put out the special edition and changed the landscape of what we cherished. Then he came out with episode one and changed the universe in more ways. I personally think Jar Jar was the last straw for many who were frustrated at this time. Narratively, Jar Jar contrasts most of episode one's serious themes. In the end, I can understand why folks don't like this character, but I just don't subscribe to it. 
In my experience, he is a good balance for the younger generation, and he is what he is. Then again, I was never bothered by the Ewoks when they were introduced in 1983 either. I think Jake Lloyd summed up this argument best. The, the stories were meant for kids. I mean, have you met a kid who really hates Jar Jar Binks? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, my little cousin hates him a lot. How much of your influence did you give to him while watching The entire time you were watching the movie. You know what you can do. Doesn't he suck? Doesn't he suck? Yeah, no, I completely agree. So after Jar Jar swears a life debt to Qui-Gon, Obi-Wan shows up. Jar Jar mentions Ota Gunga, but is hesitant to return. Qui-Gon plainly spells out that the trio are still in danger but doesn't press the point, allowing Jar Jar to have free will. It is then that Obi-Wan tries to scare Jar Jar further. If they find us, they will crush us, grind us into tiny pieces, and blast us into oblivion. Ah. Notice how Obi-Wan peers at Qui-Gon after trying to manipulate Jar Jar into doing what they want. It is not becoming of Qui-Gon's teachings, and it won't be the last time you see this in this movie. On a side note, there was a deleted scene just before this one. The reason why Obi-Wan was running from the Staps rather than dealing with them was because his lightsaber was malfunctioning. He forgot to turn off his igniter, and after he ended up in swamp water, it shorted out. He would hand Qui-Gon his lightsaber, and there was a scene that echoed a lecture where Qui-Gon tells Obi-Wan to take better care of his saber. This scene mirrored the Obi-Wan Anakin scene at the Outlander Club in Episode 2. On the shores leading to Otagunga, Jar Jar does an incredible jump into the water that many liken to Jedi powers. This leads us into another rabbit hole, and it's called the Darth Jar Jar Theory. The theory goes that Jar Jar is actually a Sith who is pretending to be a fool. Most Darth Jar Jar videos liken this quote from Lucas to the theory. Jar Jar is a key to all this. If we get Jar Jar working, because he's a funnier character than we've ever had in any of the movies before. Well, I don't think this supports the theory at all. The context of this conversation is Lucas talking to ILM about the complexities of animating Jar Jar and the special effects of the movie. If Jar Jar didn't work, the movie would crumble. This is why I think he said Jar Jar was the key. Another point to the theory is that Jar Jar is from the same planet as Palpatine. I will chalk this one up to coincidence and just move along. A hard argument to fight is that Jar Jar's body movements were based off of drunken boxing. This martial arts imitates the movements of an intoxicated person and is used to lull adversaries into a false sense of security when engaging them. As you can see, Jar Jar fits this bill perfectly. Then, there is what Ahmed Best said himself about this subject. What I can say about it is, and, and um, I kind of said this on Twitter, there's a lot about it that's true. There are some things about it that are not true. Um, could Jar Jar have evolved into that? I think the answer is yes. Um, because of the backlash, and rightfully so, Lucasfilm backed off of Jar Jar a lot. Having Best validate a lot about this theory gives it credibility. He would even go on during the interview talking about a deleted scene in Episode 2 that was shot with Palpatine and Jar Jar all alone, where they discuss plans for the Empire, but I'll cover that in the Attack of the Clones videos. The real evidence is the computer animations that are in this movie, and they are pretty impossible to refute. Animators spend countless hours on a single frame of film. Every moment in every animation is immaculate and for a reason. More so, each frame costs a ton of money where animators are concerned, some of the animations for Jar Jar are very suspicious, and I look forward to sharing them all with you. Now that you have the fundamentals of this theory, the first scene denoting possible Jedi powers is this jump. 
I would think that if Jar Jar used a force jump in front of Qui-Gon or Obi-Wan, they would sense it, or at least question it. There are many scenes where Jar Jar is doing stuff near the Jedi and they don't seem to notice. So that definitely causes reservation for my acceptance of this theory. However, the real opinion that matters is yours, so you decide on this scene specifically, and let's move on. There are more to come in the future. A nice note is that George Lucas stated in the DVD commentary that the Gungan technology is actually grown from the planet's rich plasma. Upon entering Otagunga, the citizens seem very alarmed. Darth Jar Jar theorists say it is because they fear Jar Jar. I myself have always thought it was because some strange outsiders are entering their city. Immediately, it's clear Boss Nass has no intention of helping the trespassing Jedi, and it's also made evident that there is bad blood between the Gungans and Naboo, because it is perceived one thinks they are smarter than the other. Qui-Gon simply states the facts like he did with Jar Jar, allowing Nass to exercise his free will and make his own decision. It is then that Obi-Wan steps in like before and tries to manipulate the Gungans. Please look at the scene closely. Qui-Gon's expression is not approval. It is annoyance. It's pretty obvious he wants Obi-Wan to shut up because Jin knows that Nass will not negotiate. Knowing that Nass won't help, Jin does the only thing he can do, and that is to suggest a transport. There are many lives at stake on Naboo. It does not hurt the Gungans to lose a transport or violate them in any way. A nice touch is that Jar Jar notices Nass relenting, which shows he's aware something strange just happened. Plinkett and many critics of the film often state that Qui-Gon has questionable morality in this film, and I would argue the exact opposite. Jin does not use his ability to sway others until it is clear he has no choice. Obi-Wan, on the other hand, will manipulate anyone from the first sentence he has with them, which he has already shown twice in this movie. The point is that this scene is just another glaring example of the contrast between Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan, and the actors and directors specifically did these actions and expressions for a reason. To act like it means nothing dismisses what is going on. Now that we've just passed the scene where Obi-Wan does not care about Jar Jar's situation, let me give you some bonus tidbits. In the novel, it went even further, stating that Obi-Wan shakes his head in frustration and mused that his master is too eager to involve himself when it is not necessary. He believes Qui-Gon is too quick to adopt causes that were not his own and that it cost him time and time again with the Jedi Council. In other words, Qui-Gon acts on his compassion and it annoys the Council. This leads us to Qui-Gon helping Jar Jar. Then the novel shocked me further by stating that after Boss Nass said Jar Jar was to be punished, he elaborated, and I quote, Pounded unto death this one, when speaking of Jar Jar's fate. You heard it right. Jar Jar was to be killed for returning to Otagunga. This makes Obi-Wan's callous attitude towards Jar Jar even worse in retrospect. To be truthful, I never imagined the Gungans were so harsh when watching the movie. I only mention the novel points because they are fun nuggets of insight. Even without the novel, tidbits, it's pretty clear Obi-Wan is not that compassionate. Despite this, Nass tells Jin to leave with Jar Jar, and this is when we come to the next complaint. How is a totally isolated city underwater affected at all by the Naboo being attacked by droids on the complete other side of the planet? Yes, I said the other side of the planet because... A speediest way to the Naboo is going through the planet core. By planet core, I assume he means planet core. Like the center? Usually that's what a core is. So they spend two hours flying deeper and deeper into the planet underwater. I guess to emerge on the other side of the planet? I guess? This begs the question, why did the droid armies land on the other side of the planet where the Gunga City is? 
If they expected no opposition, why land in the middle of forests and spend time chopping through the woods so far away from your target? Why not just land right outside the city? Or in the city? Again, Plinkett shows how assumptive he is because this is the planet core. As an audience, we can assume that core means the center of the planet, but our assumptions aren't always fact. Perhaps Lucas should have used a different word to make it simpler, but what's done is done. This is the parts of Naboo seen in the film in its entirety. This is where the Trade Federation landed. This is where Qui-Gon met Jar Jar. This is where Ota Gunga was. This is where the Bongo dove to enter the core. Finally, all the way to the left is how far the Bongo had to travel through the core waterways to reach Theed. The core is winding caves and waterways that you need navigators to get you through. Gungans use these waterways often so they know them. Jar Jar helped the Jedi to navigate this off-screen. To explain all this in the film would have caused more exposition to an already packed movie. For full disclosure, this picture was made after the release of Episode 1, but it was long before the Plinkett review and before many complained about the core. After Obi-Wan asked Jar Jar why he was banished, Jar Jar states this. Because maybe one or two wee little bitty accidentes, eh? You'd say, boom the gasser, then crash into Buster's hay blibber, then vanish. What Jar Jar is saying is not gibberish. He said he boomed the gasser, which is crashed a bongo, into the boss's hay gibber, which is Boss Nass's apartment, then he was banished. And he was just going to be killed for that if he returned with outsiders? I think I just gave fuel to some of the Darth Jar Jar theorists out there. When Sidious states Amidala is young and naive, it shows his only mistake in the entire movie. He underestimated her. As an interesting tidbit, the novel stated that Amidala just took office two months ago, so she is new to the job. Perhaps that was part of the reason Palpatine thought of her the way he did. Also, I want you to look in the background as some short droids walk by. You will see these droids later after the Battle of Naboo salvaging droid parts for repair. Back with the Jedi, Kenobi is trying to start the bongo. Look closely above Obi-Wan's head outside the cockpit. You can see little eel-like creatures wiggling around. As soon as the bongo gains power, a large creature reacts. The creature in this cave is actually a mother protecting her young, which you just saw. Another nice touch is Qui-Gon attempting to calm Jar Jar. He touches his shoulder and causes Jar Jar to pass out completely because he is so strong with the Force. Kenobi states that he overdid it. Our next deleted scene is when the bongo ascends into Theed. Originally, there was going to be a threat where the bongo would fall over a waterfall. This scene was interesting, but it was one of those I'm glad they cut, as it doesn't add anything to the film. I guess I should note that Plinkett treats the bongo in Theed as a moment where the main characters lack subterfuge. They can't just stay in the bongo and do nothing. Also, the Theed streets are abandoned because all the people are being rounded up and the droids would be focused in those areas. Soon enough, when the Jedi come across droids, they do act with stealth. So this argument is just pointless. Then, Plinkett continues with this. Inside the city, Queen of Manalan has been captured by the Green Guys. But instead of forcing her to sign the treaty right then and there, or keeping her locked up inside the big capitol building under heavy guard, they inexplicably send her away from them. Commander. Yes, sir. Process them. Remember, this is the most important person in their whole plan, and they send her to be processed in some place called Camp 4. Yeah, I'm with you on this one, Plinkett. 
If I was the Nemodians, I would keep her restrained right in headquarters without her entourage and push her to sign the treaty through intimidation. However, that is not what is done, and they march her away. So now we come to another Darth Jar Jar moment. This one is pretty convincing. When Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan jump down, Jar Jar slips and hangs onto the right side of the walkway. Now I want you to watch this droid right here closely. Notice how the battle droid is focused on where Jar Jar is and lines up for a kill shot. The droid fires and instantly it turns its head and you can see it is looking at Jar Jar where he lands on the opposite side of where he was hanging. This was animated specifically this way. Now look at the scene again. It appears by the animation that Jar Jar is faster than blaster fire. I'm going to say this is pretty suspicious and convincing. Another thing to note is that when the fight is going on, Obi-Wan shows off his style, which is the opposite of Qui-Gon's efficient manner. During this shot, you can see Sophia Coppola as one of the handmaidens just behind Sabi, who is pretending to be queen. When Qui-Gon suggests going to Coruscant, Amidala, in disguise, says, We are brave, your highness. I always took this as code to Sabi. In the novel, Qui-Gon was suspicious of the queen glancing towards her handmaidens for some unknown guidance. But then George Lucas himself took it further on his commentary for the Episode One DVD. Throughout the film, I have been playing with the fact earlier on that Qui-Gon knows that Padme is the queen. And he uses that, especially when they go on Tatooine. He taunts her a couple times. And in the pod race, he taunts her a couple times. Because he's just having fun with her, because he knows she's the queen. But the others around him don't. A nice touch to continuity is that later, the Trade Federation will post a tank near this hangar in an attempt to avoid ships escaping again. Directly after this scene, Obi-Wan bosses Jar Jar to stay put in the droid hull. Darth Jar Jar theorists say that while in this hold, he tampers with the hyperdrive of the ship for reasons unknown. My response to this is that there is no evidence this happens and therefore such a statement is conjecture. However, it's time to hear from Plinkett again. How does the shield generator get hit while the shields are up? Shouldn't that- oh fucker. You know, I have watched about every episode of Star Trek, at least twice except for the Kurtzman stuff, and shields and phasers often go offline or take damage while shields are up. Maybe Rick Ollie, who is the pilot, thought they were still out of range from the command ships. Also, no one said the shields were up before the generator was damaged either, so you can really take it any way you choose. Finally, before we get to Tatooine, there are four more quick arguments. The first is, why didn't the Trade Federation follow the Naboo Royal Starship if it's limping away without hyperdrive? This also goes into the problem as to why the Trade Federation did not have a swarm of vulture droids waiting for the Naboo ship when it got near the control ships. I can't argue either of these points as they are sound and make sense. It's what I would have done if I was in the Trade Federation shoes. To be fair, there is nothing to say they did not go into hyperdrive to reach Tatooine. Rick Ollie stated that they did not have enough power to get to Coruscant and that the hyperdrive was leaking. When a car has a fuel leak, it can still work till it's out of gas, so there is nothing to say they couldn't make a jump. There are two cuts after the blockade, and each shows the Naboo starship traveling without hyperdrive, so all of this can be subjective. It all depends on how you look at the cuts. Did they hyperdrive between cuts? We just don't know. For this one, you will have to decide. The third complaint is, would R2-D2 really be thanked for what he did on the starship? Plinkett thinks it's analogous to thanking the ship for doing its job. This is really a moot point because how many people in this world talk to things that don't make sense? Even Han Solo talked to the Falcon in A New Hope asking her to hold together. Hell, I've thanked a car myself for starting when it was having trouble. Lastly, 
Why would a decoy tell the queen to clean up a droid when she should be in the audience room to hear updates and concerns about their situation? To that I can say, Amidala didn't leave the room until the current discussion was over, so she missed nothing. It would also be easy to call her back when needed, so there really isn't an issue here. The second time I saw this movie, I noticed that Sabi smiles when she did this, as if it were some personal prank to the real queen. We don't know their full relationship, and maybe they do this to each other once in a while. Decoys through history are often trained extensively, sometimes beside the person they copy, so it's not beyond the possibility that Sabi and Amidala are close enough to do this. In the end, the worst case scenario would be that she would be raked over hot coals and tortured when Amidala gets her thrown back. That's sarcasm, by the way. Qui-Gon departs for Tatooine and decides to take R2 and Jar Jar. R2 is there for technical schematics and specs for the ship, and Jar Jar... Well, I don't really know why he took Jar Jar. A common complaint that I hear is why on earth would Qui-Gon leave Obi-Wan behind on the ship, and this is just plain common sense. If there was someone trying to attack the ship, having a Jedi there would help immeasurably. It would be stupid for both Jedi to leave the Naboo delegation unguarded. Anyways, as Qui-Gon leaves, Captain Panaka calls out for the party to stop and take Padme with them. This leads us to the next Darth Jar Jar moment. It is claimed that Jar Jar actually uses the force to manipulate Panaka, and he mimics every word Panaka says. Watch closely at Jar Jar's mouth and what Panaka says. They match. The Queen wishes it. The Queen wishes it. Now, I don't want to be a killjoy to the Darth Jar Jar theory, but I find this really hard to believe, because not only would Qui-Gon sense this, but Amidala already changed into her disguise clothes to go. Why would Jar Jar use the Force to talk through Panaka on a subject they are already committed to doing? Still, the animators purposefully made Jar Jar mimic Panaka, and I can't explain this. It's very weird. Another thing to note is that theorists say Panaka looks disorientated or confused after they leave, as if he realizes something happened to him. I always thought he just looked concerned because he knew Padme was his queen, but I could be mistaken. There are a lot of things to take a look at in the background when we come to the outskirts of Mos Espa, but what I really want you to notice is a family of aliens right about here. This little blue group of aliens is the family of a pod racer named Rats Tyrell. He is about to take part in the upcoming Bunta Eve race. At this moment, he is touring his family through Mos Espa in anticipation for that race. Just store Rats in your mind for later, as there is more to cover about him and his family in upcoming scenes. After arriving at the town, Qui-Gon goes to Watto's shop to find some parts. Just by doing this, there are two arguments that are thrown at this scene. Let's take a look. You say you took R2-D2 because he has the specs and the type of part you need, but yet Watto seems to know what you're talking about and you have a thingy that shows it. R2 is never used for that purpose and does nothing at all. So this next scene has a lot to unpack when it comes to the complaints department. This first complaint is obviously wrong, plain and simple. Is Qui-Gon an expert in ship mechanics and parts? Let's assume he is not. R2 could definitely know that a part is compatible and in working condition at the point of sale. If Qui-Gon bought a part that was defective or didn't fully match the ship, he would be out of luck, period. Does any car part work with a Ford model? Would any tire be compatible with any car out there? Plus, we have to remember that Tatooine isn't known for the most honest and trusting people. Does Plinkett expect Qui-Gon to just trust Watto when he says he has Nubian parts? If I walked into a car parts store and didn't know a thing about a carburetor, and I said I needed one, and someone picked one out, I would have no clue if it worked or not. I would just have to trust them. Why should Qui-Gon be any different? Being a Jedi does not make you know everything. 
So taking R2, who has already been shown to do maintenance on the Naboo starship, is basic common sense. It would be stupid to not take him. Just because you don't see R2 checking the part doesn't mean he didn't do it sooner or later before the part went to the ship. Also, just because Qui-Gon has a holograph of the ship doesn't mean the holograph knows what parts go to the ship. If I took a picture of my car, would you or most people know what parts should go with it? What if Watto didn't even know about what comes with a Nubian ship? and Qui-Gon only took the hollow of the craft. Well, I guess he'd have to go back to the ship and get R2 if we followed Plinkett's assumption. This is just a lame argument trying to justify more dislike for a film. It is not even thought out on a basic level. This also leads me to believe that Qui-Gon Jinn is incredibly stupid. He could have just went to another junk dealer and used his Jedi mind trick to swap out the Republic credits for money that Watto would take. In fact, when they arrive in town, he says, We'll try one of the smaller dealers. Smaller dealers? Well, that implies there's larger ones. At this second, Qui-Gon and crew just walked out the door as Watto is talking to Anakin. From the moment Anakin leaves to the moment he runs into Jar Jar again, it is approximately 1 minute and 12 seconds of screen time. Would it really take Anakin 1 minute and 12 seconds to finish his chores to traveling to Jar Jar. It is ridiculous to think that's the case. So if Anakin is starting his chores just a second before this shot, do we really think that Jin and crew just sat in the streets talking? Do we really think Qui-Gon just trusted Watto at his words about Republic credits and the part needed? Isn't there a good chance they did visit shops in that time? No doubt Qui-Gon would realize that Watto is right and then message the ship desperately looking for something to sell. There is no proof they did or did not go to another shop, so stop acting like they didn't is a given. Hey, here's another idea. Why don't you trade the Naboo cruiser for a less fancy but functional ship? Or maybe hire a transport? Pay them all the money you have now and then promise more when you get to Coruscant. Sound familiar? Someone who's like a, a, a transport ship captain or a smuggler would have use for Republic credits because they travel around the galaxy. If someone is selling an Air Force One type of craft on Tatooine, would it not get unwanted attention? This is a Queen's Royal Starship. How much attention would this type of ship get when selling it? Thank the maker, Qui-Gon asked to park the ship on the outskirts of Mos Espa so it would not attract undue attention. On a hut planet where gangsters kidnap anyone for money, I wouldn't take the risk of letting anyone see that ship if I could avoid it. Booking passage is a viable option if done carefully. Taking the queen and key personnel to Coruscant while the rest stored up in the starship could work. Then after getting to Coruscant, Palpatine or someone else can arrange to rescue the people left behind. In the end, I can't damn the movie for a route not taken. After running into Anakin, a sandstorm occurs and Qui-Gon heads to his home. It is there the seeds for the Boonta Eve occurs. Perhaps Qui-Gon could have searched for a smuggler, but the race was the most immediate solution to their situation. Was it a gamble? Sure. But so could putting out the word for smugglers around a town where known bounty hunters like Room Sleg or Aura Singh are walking about. Not to mention other bad characters like the slave trader named Graxel Kelvin visiting for the race. Don't forget Jabba is in town, and with him, goons. The town is pretty dangerous and with questionable folk. We know that Mos Eisley is a spaceport, and it's a hub at that. Mos Espa is not as big as Mos Eisley. So finding smugglers here might be a little more difficult. So it's time that Anakin meets Padme and they have their discussion. A novel tidbit is that Anakin stated in this conversation that he was going to marry her someday. Later in the film when Padme goes to Anakin in the starship while he is cold and sad, he hands her the Japur snippet. In the book Padme responds, 
I don't need this to remember you. How could I forget my future husband? This was said in an attempt to cheer him up. This would have been great in the film and could have helped with chemistry between the two and would have impacted the depth of her keeping it and being buried with it. That's a wish rather than a complaint, though. Anyways, the dialogue between Anakin and Padme bring us to the next huge complaint levied towards episode one. There are no signs of life in this movie at all. The performances are stiff, the lines are dry and lifeless, and the movie isn't even directed in an engaging way. Everybody kind of talks the same, and it's really awkward? Like, who the fuck talks like this? This is incredible. We recommend a commission be sent to Naboo to ascertain the truth. The Congress of Malastare concurs with the Honorable Delegate from the Trade Federation. When you start the movie, you might think that the Jedi just talk in this weird, overly wordy way because they're like warrior monks. I kind of accept the fact that they talk weird. But everybody fucking talks like this, except the Jamaican and the literal child. No one likes little kids, especially ones that can't act. Peruskin? Cut, let's try it again. I'm a person and my name is Anakin. It's a kiss of death for your movie. My complaints are your complaints. The acting is so wooden, the writing so fifth grade, the effects way too computer generated, the comedy way too kindergarten, the stereotypes way too offensive. Yeah, what else can I say about this that every other person on the planet hasn't said? Well, let me say something that has not been said. The acting is just fine, and overall the performances fit appropriately with the characters depicted in this movie. Let me explain. Amidala, the Jedi, and the Senate are all political entities that control their image. They are reserved, professional, and careful what they say. Spontaneity and emotion is not necessarily how they should act. The only character acting slightly out of this norm is Qui-Gon. Also, guards and advisors would also refrain from their expressions and outbursts as well. So I argue that all these actors and actresses played their characters in a realistic fashion representative of a political culture. A senator, queen, advisor, or councils would not act outside their position, and if they did, they would not be there long. I have raised several nine-year-olds, and their speech is not always graceful. I will say Jake's delivery is off at times, but it didn't destroy the film or his abilities in my eyes. Jake was playing an innocent child, and he tries his best to project that. I would say he does that because I believed Anakin was selfless in the movie. Also, he does invoke feelings throughout the movie. Here are some examples. No. Will I ever see you again? I can go on, but you get my point. He did emote, and he wasn't a blank slate as many claim. He is really treated poorly for his performance in this film, and he doesn't deserve that. I don't think his performance is perfect, but I do think he put in the effort and did a good job, right, wrong, or indifferent. A very loaded complaint claims that Watto, Jar Jar, and the Nemodians are racist stereotypes. Let's listen to what George has to say. The movie is pretty neutral. It is in outer space. These are aliens. How in the world you could take an orange amphibian and say that he's a Jamaican? I mean, even the idea of taking his ears and calling them dreadlocks is kind of a strange stretch as far as I'm concerned. I mean, it's completely absurd. Then there's the actor Silas Carson on the take of Newt Gunray. George listened to a number of, he actually got actors around the world to record lines and then he listened and kind of figured out for himself what he thought sounded right. And there's a very strange thing that happens to Thai actors uh, speaking English words. It sounded as though they were blocked up nasally. Just, you know, like we all 
have different ways of speaking. If you listen to an American accent, it's a lot more nasal than an English accent. It's right up here in the nose. And so with these Thai guys, it just felt as though their noses were blocked. It's just one of the things that happens with the accent. And George thought this sounded right because the Nemoidians have no noses. You know, so it, it sounded as though they was kind of, you know, caught in their in their faces. So that's why he went for that accent. And then we thought about where the voice is placed in a kind of in character terms. And I came up with Peter Laurie, who played a lot of these very kind of slimy, cowardly kind of characters. So I based a lot of the work on him because that's exactly what Newt Gunray is. He's he's a slime ball. I wonder if Ahmed Best feels Jar Jar is racist. I never heard an interview of him claiming that. If a person sees racist depictions in these performances, then no matter what I would say would matter. So let's move on. I'm going to say it, and I don't care about the reaction. Ahmed Best was perfect to play Jar Jar. His body movements are amazing and wonderful for that character. It was exactly the kind of performance that inspired young people, not adults. I would also say his voice and timing was dead on for this character. Adults may not have laughed, but kids sure did. I'm not saying I love Jar Jar or see him as this great character. What I am saying is that Best was a great actor for this character. It's a bummer that he and this character were ostracized so much. With that said, we have come to the end of part one. I'll see you in part two. That's exactly what they'll be expecting us to do.